In the Encounters episode entitled Almost Human, we explored stories that challenged conventional concepts regarding human nature. In the conclusion, we will explore this idea further, with an eye towards our interactions with the unseen worlds. Are we at the mercy of inexorable forces of the numinous? Or do we actually have the power to interact with and even bend them to our will? Can both be true, and if so, where is this line drawn? In this episode you will hear stories of fairy servants, spiritual warfare with demons, an inadvertent road trip into another dimension, as well as one of my personal experiences of astral projection, all of which will hopefully serve to highlight the dynamic relationship between human beings and the supernatural its potential ability to influence us, and our ability to influence it, like the magical practitioners of old. Welcome to The Hidden Passage, a podcast exploring all things supernatural, from ancient history to modern day. Elf Help 101 My father's family believes in fairies, which in Mexico are called the Aluks. I admit that I do too. My grandma lives in an old colonial house in Mexico, and there she gives them candies and talks to them. For example, if something's broken, she'll ask them for help. And in a few days, whatever is broken is repaired. She used to own a restaurant. So if she had to pay for something or needed money, she would ask them for help. And then in one way or another, the money would always find its way to her. I really love the old house she lives in. I spent most of my childhood there. I would sometimes find myself speaking to it. I would ask the house and its fairy occupants to take care of my grandma. Some years ago, one night a few days before Christmas, I was playing my Nintendo DS when I heard a strange sound, like something small was jumping on my suitcase. The noise frightened me, so I tried not to react, pretending I couldn't hear it. It stopped for a bit, and then it started up again. This time I used the light of my DS to try and see what it was, but there was nothing there. Later on I tried making a trap, or rather, some contraption that would prove their existence. I put some candies on a plate in the living room, and surrounded it with flour so that if one of them went to take the candy, they would leave behind footprints. I set it out overnight, and the next day, I went to check, and holy shit. I wasn't expecting to find anything, but crap. I saw little feet. I know it wasn't a mouse, because there weren't any tail marks, and the prints were larger than a mouse. Again, I pretended I didn't see anything and threw the flower in the garden. I was super scared. I want to point out that my grandma doesn't have any pets, and she always closes the door to that room, and I was the only person who knew about the experiment. It's 
good to see the old ways are still alive in some places. For some reason, a lot of, or even most of the stories that I hear nowadays are coming out of Central and South America when it comes to any type of fairy entity. Another interesting thing about this is that it looks to be some type of physical entity. Whereas if we're talking about the way Paracelsus describes them, uh, they're more of a non-physical or etheric being. But here we have something leaving footprints behind. So that's a little bit of a riddle there. Uh, and that comes up a lot, not just in the fairy sightings, but Bigfoot and all those other cryptids. You know, I, I know a lot of people want to claim that they're just these unknown animals, but there's a lot of evidence that often gets overlooked that, you know, kind of throws that whole hypothesis into question. I might have mentioned this a while back, but um, there was one story about a, a dog man, and the guy was a farmer and it had snowed, and he went out to his field in the morning and he saw giant footprints. Um, but they just appeared in the middle of his field. It wasn't like it came from the woods. Like, you couldn't trace from where it came. It just started in the middle of the field and walked off, and then at a certain point, just stopped. And there's countless examples of the, the Bigfoot footprints all the time. They can't track where they actually go at a certain point. They just stop. And they come up with all these elaborate theories of uh, fucking, you know, like skin flaps that they put over their feet that don't leave a footprint or something like that. Ironically, it becomes almost easier to explain when we just admit that there are other dimensions and possibly things that have the ability to move in and out of dimensions. There's this idea that we have a physical body, an etheric body that uh, resides in a higher dimension. We can think of it as different frequencies, like um, different rates of vibration. Think of the states of solid, liquid, and gas based on rates of vibration, the amount of energy contained in the atoms. The etheric realm is just on a higher frequency from the highest frequency in the material world. Maybe. Or maybe I'm just talking out of my ass. I don't know. But anyway, at the very least, it's, it's a good metaphor for that, I think. Like, water, uh, when it changes to a vapor state, it's no longer visible, but we still know that it's there. So I've been told by certain shamanic practitioners that essentially these creatures like fairies or Bigfoot or whatever have a sort of intuitive ability to shift dimensions, which just has to do with the rates of vibration that they're resonating with. And they intuit this. Uh, they're kind of born with it. Animals essentially intuit everything that they do. They're not creating a technology or rationalizing it. This is just something that they know instinctively. Whereas these shamans, they have to train themselves and really kind of break themselves out of this rational mind, which often gets in the way of any kind of spiritual practice that's like the first step to anything that anyone of any practice will tell you is you have to turn off the rational mind, stop the internal dialogue, and that is kind of the gateway. Self-defense sorcery. When I was around 14, while at Boy Scout camp, my friends and I were playing light as a feather, stiff as a board. At some point during this, 
I felt some invisible presence enter the tent. Suddenly, I felt as though I was being attacked. Dude, are you okay? Totally. I came to understand later on that I had been partially possessed by an entity. This game served as an invitation, similar to what people say about Ouija, even though I was only watching and not participating. Their rules on what constitutes an invitation are not the same as ours, and it took me a while to figure them out. Seemingly innocuous things like walking through a haunted house, if done on purpose, can easily lead to an attachment and astral hitchhikers. At any rate, this one event progressed into multiple attachments by more than one being which I now refer to as infernals. They could actually control my body. For a few seconds when I was first waking up and still in the hypnagogic state, they would do things like make me dream that I was sitting in a chair in my room, and then I would wake up actually in the chair after having fallen asleep in my bed. I remember five different disembodied voices that would say that they could do this to me whenever they wanted. You are mine. They would even tell me to kill people and explain how easy it is to take someone's life. Kill them all. Kill them. Kill them all. It's as easy as one, two, three. <laughs> they would cause me to have disturbing visions, like blood running over my hands. This horrified me at 14, and I have some PTSD from these experiences. I spent a great deal of time learning how to kick these entities out so they could no longer influence me. Over the course of many years, I have practiced distinguishing my own thoughts from those which are not mine, and can now isolate them. At this point in my life, I lived in a haunted cabin in the Sierras, and there I learned how to tell when an entity is present. As it passes by, you can literally feel the shivers run up your spine and scalp. Over time, my senses got better to the point where I can now notice them from 5 to 10 feet away. A word of advice for anyone dealing with these things? Latch down your body and mind. Get angry and don't let them do what they want. They will try to instill great fear in you so that you give up. Don't. Eventually I gained experience in lucid dreaming, astral travel, and sorcery techniques outlined in the work of Carlos Castaneda. I learned particular movements of the body, tensegrity or magical passes, which are things like arm positioning and body movements, coupled with focusing the will. I found that for some reason this forces out the ones that have already placed an attachment in you. An important part of this work consisted of learning how to move objects and wield energy in the astral through the power of thought and remembering those thought patterns, which are more like feelings. That way I could reproduce it in my waking life as well. It essentially shuts them out, and I can also use these techniques to attack them and defend myself if I wish. A couple years ago I was watching a movie around midnight the day after Halloween. And, just like before, something came into the room, immediately setting off the shivers in my spine. Then I felt it try to shove itself in the back of my head, just at the base of my skull, which is one of the locations they try to enter the body. It pissed me off to no end, the bastard. But I slammed down my defenses and fought it off. Despite the skills I've gained, I still have an infernal attached to me, which I think has been there for many years. All the others I can boot, but I can't budge this one. It has an attachment placed in my lower left abdomen. 
I pick them up generally while lucid dreaming as I move my consciousness to different places. Anyways, I hope no one has to learn the way I did. I know it's difficult for people who've never experienced anything like this to wrap their heads around, but I'm telling the truth on this. Alright, so the first thing I want to say is for anybody who's getting into astral projection or any kind of spiritual exploration, I don't want this kind of experience to scare people. I've read a lot of reports of people who have astral traveled. I even have some experience of it myself. And the idea of getting an attachment is... Uh, pretty rare. I almost never hear about it. The level of attachment he's talking about, at first I didn't even believe it because I think most of the time that doesn't happen. And yeah, they talk about the invitations and Ouija. This light is a feather, stiff as a board. I'd never heard of that. I don't know if you guys have, but apparently it's like everybody puts their hands below a person and like they put their fingers up and they try to levitate the person so apparently somehow that is an invitation too which you know just sounds like bullshit honestly like i don't think that kind of thing should happen to a person just for that so i don't want people who i've never heard anything about this to base their opinion on that by this report because I think it it can be a very beneficial practice. However, at the same time, there are those in the astral projection community who kind of create the impression that there are no dangers involved, which I don't think anyone can honestly say that with any certainty because we're we're dealing with uh, something that nobody at this stage really understands fully. This is at the outer limits of the human experience. But all that is to just say simply that do your research before you get into any kind of spiritual practice, even if it's just meditation. Learn how to control your mind and your feelings because a lot of that is going to shape your experience. Like I've talked about in the episode on demons, a lot of these things are attracted to the negative energy that you put out. Rudolf Steiner says that essentially they're actually almost born from those things. Born from those errant aspects of your own emotional inner life that you can't integrate properly into yourself. And so it almost uh, splits off of you and becomes its own entity. Don't be afraid, but also don't just rush headlong into something. Especially when it comes to the hallucinogens and psychedelics. Those can be really helpful tools, but traditionally they were only administered to people who were under the direction of a mentor, of a master shaman who knew how to keep the person safe and guide their journey. In most of the shamanic traditions, they don't rely on power plants. This is, this is a myth. What they do use them for is for the initial initiation. They'll use it to crack a person open, so to speak, just to kind of expand their consciousness, just so they know what's out there, what that um, state of mind feels like, so they know how to kind of get back there. But no shaman worth their salt in my opinion, in my, based on what I've learned, uh, relies on these power plants to reach uh, altered states, to go on these spirit journeys. One of the main tenets of shamanism is uh, ultimate freedom and control over your own mind, over your own spirit. And to go into these realms on a specific mission for a specific purpose, to help a patient, to do something for the tribe, to bring knowledge back. Uh, but as anyone who's done psychedelics could tell you, 
That's not what's going to happen if you take a power plant. You're just basically along for the ride at that point. You know, in a lot of the shamanic cultures, they'll talk about the power plants like they have their own spirit, their consciousnesses unto themselves. So when you take it, you're taking in the spirit of that plant. Referring back to Castaneda, again, I've been reading a lot of Castaneda lately. It's very interesting. Um, If you haven't read it, you should check it out. I don't know whether it's a true story or not, but he's definitely pulling a lot of real uh, facts from the ethnographic literature that's out there. So he has this mentor, Don Juan, and he talks about this thing called the gap of awareness. So when a person goes through the process of becoming aware of what they call non-ordinary reality, which most often was referred to as the spirit world, um, a sort of gap forms in their energy body. So you can think of the energy body as like an egg. I think I've talked about this before. Some people call it the aura. In a sense, it acts as a, a shield from other influences. A gap forms when somebody comes aware, according to Don Juan. And when this gap forms, it is a like an Achilles heel. It's a point of access, a point of vulnerability through which spirits or Uh, They have their own terminology for everything, and they call them inorganic beings. So these inorganic beings can now access you, along with any of the other energies that are floating around out there, of which there are many. So developing this sight or awareness is, in a sense, a great burden because now you're susceptible to all of these energies around you. They still affect all people on some level, but for 99% of the population, Don Juan says that their own ignorance is essentially their shield. Ignorance is bliss. So if you're not aware of it, it's not going to affect you, essentially, in the same way that it would affect Uh, a man of knowledge, as they would call it. So by becoming a sorcerer or a man of knowledge or a seer, these are all variations of the same thing, there's the potential to gain greater power than the average person, but there's also the potential for more danger. To put it in new age terminology, once you wake up, you can't live like a normie anymore. But being a normie is bad either way. But especially if you extricate yourself from that state, um, you definitely don't want to go back. Do not be afraid. Do not. You know, true. On Even if it's just on a psychological level. Because now you know the potential. Now you know that there's another way to live. So how, how the fuck can you go back? But anyway. So this mentor, Don Juan, teaches Castaneda... Um, various methods of defending the gap, the gap of awareness. I think this person is onto something with his methodology, but I just have to ask, did you try calling on Jesus? I'm somewhat joking, but I do think that invoking a higher power or some sort of higher being that has authority over whatever is plaguing you Uh, Oftentimes, that is enough to get the job done. You can combine that with uh, any form of protection ritual or banishing. If you're magically minded and into ritual. While we're on the subject, I thought this might be a good time to share with you guys a couple of my own stories. As I hinted at earlier, I have actually had some out-of-body experiences myself. It took me a while to entertain the possibility that this wasn't just some strange psychological phenomenon. If it were not for the evidence that seemed to indicate otherwise, 
I never believed in astral projection until my repeated experiences forced me to reconsider. If someone had told me the things that I'm going to tell you a few years ago, I would not have believed them. In a way, this is what initially put me on the path to making this podcast in the first place. Because once I got some confirmation of these hidden dimensions of reality, I wanted to learn everything I could about them. These experiences have been happening to me sporadically for the past few years. Before that, I pretty much had gone my whole life without any paranormal experience at all. And for some reason, that changed. It was as if some door had suddenly been opened. I've had many strange experiences in this regard, and I plan on going over more of them when I get around to doing an episode on astral projection. But for now, I just want to share with you an EVP that I inadvertently captured and the events that led up to it. So my first out-of-body experience happened a few years back, uh, and this was totally spontaneous and involuntary on my part. And since then, I've learned to have some level of control over it, and I can sort of induce these altered states of awareness consciously. But I still struggle to do this, and I'll go for long periods of time where nothing happens to me at all. So back in the fall sometime in October, which, as we know, was considered to be a time when the veil between worlds became thin. I managed to astral project briefly a few times. I don't know exactly what triggers them. I just know how to recognize when it's happening and sort of take hold of the process. So the first time I felt distinctly that my consciousness was separating from my body, it, which is a very hard thing to describe in words. It's sort of like suddenly becoming aware of yourself in the third person. I then attempted to leave my body and at this point became aware of my etheric body. I had the sense of having arms and legs and I used them to try to climb out of bed. As I did so, I heard a distinct voice of a woman. Wow! I turned my attention to the doorway where the source of the sound was, and I saw a shadowy woman who looked similar to the girl from the horror movie The Ring. Her hair was dark, and it obscured her face, and she wore a white dress. I got the impression that she was impressed in that she didn't expect me to be able to do what I had just done. In fact, I was just as surprised myself, but the fear of seeing her quickly pulled me back into my body. On the second attempt, I managed to go further, but after floating through the darkness for some time without reaching a destination, I was again pulled back. So the next morning, I happen to check this app on my phone that monitors my sleep and records any noise that is in the room. Most of the time, it's just me snoring, but this one recording caught my eye that was labeled voice and talking. Now, keep in mind, I've used this app many times, and not once has it ever recorded me talking in my sleep. I don't believe that I do this at all in general, and no one has ever told me that I do. If you listen closely to this EVP, you can actually hear me breathing while two separate voices are speaking in the background. They seem to be repeating the same word, which as far as I can make out is C. I considered that maybe this was some kind of initiating command to get me to see the astral realm. It reminded me of the old magical practitioners who it was claimed got their powers from their spirit familiars themselves. So one of the voices you're about to hear is in a deeper register than my voice can even go. And at the end of the recording, there is also a distinct whistle. 
So without further ado, I'm going to play this for you guys a few times and you can be the judge as to what the hell this is. <laughs> Now you can see why I said that when we project our consciousness into these dimensions, it attracts the attention of whatever is out there. Stare into the abyss and the abyss looks back. I do have reasons for why I say the things that I say that go a little beyond just reading something on the internet. A lot of times the research material that I put out tracks with what has been my own experience. So my last experience in this October time frame was probably the scariest as well as the saddest that I've ever had. It happened one night when I was beginning to drift off to sleep and suddenly I became aware that I was in a room that was different than mine. It was very dark other than what seemed like pale moonlight coming through a large window. Suddenly a noise began to emanate from the corner of the room, the source of which I couldn't see. At first it almost sounded like the slow creaking of a door beginning to move. It quickly grew exponentially louder, like it was gaining some kind of momentum. It was then I realized that this sound was the voice of a woman, a shrieking, blood-curdling wail that became so frenzied that it seemed to morph into the sound of a wild animal. This sound and whatever presence was behind it seemed to rush towards me. No exaggeration, it filled me with the most intense fear and dread that I have probably ever felt in my life. Right at the point it was about to reach me, I came to, with chills just running up and down my body and my eyes watering. I didn't know what to think of it at all, but after mentioning it to a friend the next day, the first thing he said to me was, it sounds like a banshee. And when I heard that, I couldn't believe I hadn't thought of it. I've read plenty of tales about the wailing fairy woman, the omen of death. The Irish folklore states that when somebody hears the scream of the banshee, it means that the death of someone close to you is imminent. And lo and behold, a few weeks later, my grandmother passed away. My family is Irish, and it's said that every Irish family has a banshee to warn them of a death in the family. It's funny, I hear so many stories of the supernatural happening to other people, but subconsciously I never think it could actually happen to me. And even when it does, too often I shrug it off until something like this slaps me across the face. And still, the skeptic in me wonders if it was all just a coincidence. I just want to state for the record that I am not schizophrenic. I don't hear or see things in my waking life. It's only in these altered states of consciousness in between wakefulness and sleep that these things happen to me. And I know I'm not alone or unique in this. But I think too many people discount these experiences as sleep paralysis or hypnagogic hallucinations. And I have somewhat of a unique perspective to realize that this is only the beginning stage of a much deeper phenomenon. Oftentimes, before I have an out-of-body experience, I will have these sleep paralysis type episodes, or I'll just start hearing random noises in the room. I think this willful ignorance to this phenomenon is a real hindrance 
to investigative efforts into the paranormal. Not only do I think it could add to our research, but I also believe that it could be, in fact, the key to our understanding. And lastly, I just want to say that I'm not claiming that I know any of this is real in any objective sense. All I can say is that these experiences feel much more real than any dream I've ever had. The things that I've seen in these states are much stranger than my dreams, which are most of the time pretty boring. And the ones that I just told you about are actually pretty tame compared to a lot of the other stories I have. I also know that when I'm not doing things that are supposed to ward away negative energies, I'm much more likely to be harassed by these nighttime intruders. So at the end of the day, it's hard for me to imagine that all of this could just be a product of the mind. Of course, the mind is a great mystery, so it is certainly possible. As somebody once astutely noted, it is all in your head. You just have no idea how big your head is. I normally don't talk about my experiences with anybody because most people just look at me like I'm nuts or they just think that I'm having weird dreams and that it's weird that I'm making them out to be more than they are. But people have gone out on a limb to share their experiences with me and allow me to publish them, so I kind of feel it's incumbent on me to do the same. Road Trip to the Abyss One day I was driving past Parker, Arizona, when my boyfriend accidentally took a wrong turn. We quickly realized that something was very wrong, because the next thing we knew, everything just became pitch black. What time is it? The sun was just gone. There were no buildings or any landmarks and no sound. Just blank emptiness. Keep in mind, before we had taken the turn, it had been broad daylight and sunny. A clear spring day and around one or two in the afternoon. There were no mountains or anything that would have obscured it, just flat Arizona desert as far as the eye could see. As we kept on driving, we noticed a big white sign on the side of what should have been the road, but we couldn't see that either. All we could see in the pitch black void was a sign, like a road sign, and in big letters it said, They're here. Turn around now. We both looked at each other and said, Fuck that. And immediately we turned around. And after a while, we found the freeway again and were able to get home. We decided that we would never speak of it again. But to be honest... I have been haunted by this experience my whole life, so I just had to share it. So we've discussed triangle areas, portals, perhaps caused by these lines of convergence in the Earth's energy field, the ley lines. There appear to be these natural vortexes all over the earth. Also in magical practice, it's believed that portals can be opened and if they're not closed properly, they will stay there. 
It seems here that things can move from one plane of existence to another more easily. It is, by all intents and purposes, a doorway. So if someone were to accidentally cross through this portal, it's conceivable that something like this could happen. Think about the Bermuda Triangle, all these planes that will disappear while flying through it. This could explain some of the disappearances in the state forest, the missing 411. And it's interesting to note that this is not just a modern phenomenon. This is an old belief that comes up again and again. The fairy forts or the rings that were said to transport a person into the fairy realm. To bring up Don Juan again, he calls them places of power. And I'm sure there's a lot of examples in Native American lore about these places of high energy. Now, can you literally drive a car into another dimension? Does it take your physical body? Or is this more of a movement of consciousness? The way that these non-physical planes seem to operate based on my research and some of my own experience is that images can be presented to you in any form. Everything is directed by consciousness. So sometimes an entity will manipulate the environment or what you perceive to be the environment to send you a message. Form is much more fluid and changeable and can really manifest in any way. This is why the magicians in the old grimoire traditions, when they were evoking the spirit, they would say something along the lines of, come and appear unto me and take the form that is most pleasing and answer my questions in a straightforward manner. They knew the spirits could take any form that they wished, or at least make you see them in any way that they wished. There probably isn't an interdimensional highway somewhere with a road sign that says that. Instead, what this feels like is a direct, sort of tailor-made message for these people that was being sent in a way that they could understand, in a situation that would otherwise be completely incomprehensible to them. Because our puny human minds can't handle the reality of something as it is, it has to be presented to us in a way that we can process it. It's kind of like that meme of the biblically accurate angels that actually look like these giant whirling wheels with the thousand eyeballs or whatever. And they're just kind of levitating around saying, Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. In the Bible, it's always said that you can't see the true form of God or else you would just die, basically. This is also an ideal that's expressed in the alchemical traditions that says that when you are transmuting the soul, that unless your soul has been purified to a certain extent, it won't survive the process. So I guess it's probably a good thing that they saw the sign and turned around. But, you know, a part of me wants to drive out there myself and just see what's going on. What do you say? Want to go for a road trip? Get in. How long can we maintain, I wonder? How long before one of us starts raving and jabbering at this boy? What will he think then? Before we get out of here, I just want to thank who appears to be an anonymous viewer. Um, they donated through Super Thanks. If there's a name attached, I apologize, but it's not showing up for me for some reason. If you would also like to support my work, you can do so through Super Thanks, which should show up as a little button right below the video or you can also donate through DonorBox. And that will be the first link in the link section right below the profile page. Uh, DonorBox is preferable since they take less of a cut, but however anyone wants to do it is cool with me. 
I want to thank Kyle Hughes for his donation on there. Every little bit helps and allows me to spend a little more time creating content. In other news, I am working on a channel membership program, which will be another way that you can support me. I'm thinking right now I'm going to only offer a single tier, and that will be at $4 a month. Eventually, once I put together some bonus content, I will probably set up some higher tier options over on Patreon. But for now, I think this is a fun outlet for anyone who wants to give their support and be recognized for it. Channel members will get custom badges designed by yours truly that will appear next to their name in the comments and on live streams. You'll also have access to custom emojis. Uh, There's going to be all kinds of fun stuff related to the topics that we cover here. Bigfoot, fairies, shamans, ghosts, demons, you name it. I will also be offering priority and more thorough replies to comments, addressing any thoughts or questions that you guys might have. There will also be member-only updates, behind-the-scenes posts and photos, polls where you can give feedback and suggest ideas for future content. So to anyone interested in joining, keep an eye out for that in the near future. And that's going to be it for now. Stay tuned because we have some great seasonal content coming in October. Uh, We're going to be covering the history of Halloween and vampires. So can't wait to discuss that with you guys. Thanks again, and I'll see you in the comments section.